Today I'm sad because I tried to go to Niagara Falls, but I had car trouble instead. But at least I got this bottled water. I hate plastic. Anyway, I'm gonna read this thing encased in plastic. It's At the Cafe, Conversations on Anarchism by Erico Malatesta. We're not gonna read the whole thing. It's too long to do in one sitting. Um, but that's what we're gonna do. And we're gonna start with the introduction. Malatesta began writing the series of dialogues that make up At the Cafe, Conversations on Anarchism in March, 1897 while he was hiding in Ancona and busy with the production of the period period periodical, the agitation, I think it's like agitation, Luigi Fabri, in his account of this period written to introduce the 1922 edition of the full set of dialogues, edited by Malatesta, gives us a beguiling picture of Malatesta, clean shaven as a disguise, coming and going about the city, pipe in mouth, smiling impudently at his friends who, for the sake of his safety, wished him elsewhere. The idea of the dialogues was suggested to him by the fact that he often frequented a cafe that was not usually the haunt of subversives such as himself. Indeed, one of the regulars who was a member of the police used to engage Malatesta in conversation without, of course, as Fibri notes, any idea that a real prize lay within his grasp. Anarchism would almost certainly have been one of the topics of conversation since the anarchists of the city constantly bombarded their fellow townspeople with a barrage of propaganda that occasioned frequent trials. The form that the dialogues were to take was drawn then from an actual venue and from Malatesta's own experience. It resulted in a literary device excellently well suited to his particular genius, which is his ability to render complex ideas into straightforward language and to make them directly accessible. The dialogue form also allowed Malatesta to debate the ideas of his opponents while subjecting his own anarchist views to a critical scrutiny aimed at communicating to his readers their political import and their practical applica applicability. Indeed, one of the strengths of the dialogue is the absence of straw men. The Inquisition of Anarchism is searching and genuine, often highlighting what its opponents would regard as points of weakness and vulnerability. It makes Malatesta's spirit of defense all the more impressive. Towards the end of 1897, Malatesta was identified and discovered by the Ancona police. He was arrested and then released. Immediately, he began a round of lectures, abandoning both his journal and the unfinished dialogues. In 1898, he was placed under house arrest, and in March 1899, he fled abroad, once more becoming a refugee. The dialogues remained inter interrupted at number 10 and in this form were published both in journals and as a pamphlet. The chief propagandist of the first 10 dialogues are Malatesta's alter ego, Giorgio, an anarchist, Prospero, a wealthy member of the bourgeoisie, Cesare, a shopkeeper, and Ambrosio, a magistrate. Malatesta is thus able to reflect a range of political positions and views drawn from a wide spectrum of society. If Prospero speaks for wealth and privilege, Cesare speaks for the smaller property owners in the middle classes. He shows an awareness of social problems and appears amiable to persuasion by Giorgio, but he also exhibits a concern that any solution must not be allowed to disrupt the existing social order. That is like every middle class person I talk to is like, but my land, my land, I say in a house. It's not my house, but I'm sitting in it. Mm. Ambrosio is the voice of the law and the liberal state and of accepted ideas on rights and justice. He is also, as Giorgio's chief opponent, the one who expresses common sense views about human nature and human behavior. His views contain a liberal expression of rights theory, tempered by what he would claim as recognition of the limits imposed on liberty by the inescapable dictates of reality. The result is a broad canvas on which Malatesta is able in responding to the various viewpoints and in answering the numerous criticisms that Giorgio's views elicit to paint a skillfully drawn and detailed picture of an anarchist view of the world. In a relatively short space, Malatesta introduces us to all of the basic doctrines of communist anarchism and considers one by one many of the major objections to his position. 
After setting the scene, it is private property and, pop and property rights that become the focus of attention. In Dialogues 2, 3, and 4, it is argued that the causes of poverty are located in the nature of the property system and its associated class structure, and a forceful attack is mounted on the right to private property and the capitalist system, with incidental discussions of Malthus and, right, Malthus and free trade. At the same time, the notions of a complete change in the property regime and the creation of society without government are introduced. The origin of property and property rights are considered in Dialogue 5, and Giorgio maintains that property rights must be abolished if exploitation is to be avoided. In Dialogue 6, the case for common ownership is made and the idea of communism introduced. This discussion of communism continues in Dialogue 7 with opposition to it as a tyrannical and oppressive system being strongly maintained by Ambrosio in the name of abstract liberty. Giorgio counters with a depiction of anarchist society as a voluntary, complex federation of associations, and in the process contrasts the anarchist form of free communism with that of the authoritarian school. This is like Marxist Leninism, or what would go on to become really. Dialogue 8 moves the focus to the question of government and the state and how a society can function in their absence. In the process, there is an extended critique of parliamentarianism and representation and a defense of anarchism as a social order maintained by free agreement and voluntary delegation. The argument continues into the next dialogue, Dialogue 9, where the objections to a society without government are again rehearsed and Giorgio further develops a form of Karpotkin's argument about the universality of mutual aid, an idea first introduced in Dialogue 6. Discourse 10 strikes out in a new direction, focusing on sex, love, and family. In covering many issues related to feminism, any inherent basis for gender inequality is persuasively dismissed. <clears throat> it was 15 years later, in 1913, that Malatesta returned to the Dialogues. At this time, he had once more established himself in Ancona, and had begun the publication of his new journal, Volonta. In this new publication, he, repu he republished the original 10 dialogues in an edited and corrected form and added four more. Initially in dialogues 11 and 12, it is once again Césaire, Prospero, and Ambrogio who are Giorgio's interlocutors. The issue of criminality is raised in dialogue 11. How do we deal with criminals in the absence of government, law, courts, or prisons? Giorgio answers that the issue must be dealt with communally. From here, the discussion moves on to a contrast between mental and manual labor and the old chestnut of who is to do the jobs that nobody wants to do. Won't everyone want to be a poet? I've met enough people, not everyone wants to be a poet. The usual answer is provided. <clears throat> that is a voluntary rotation of tasks and the development of multiple skills by community members. Dialogue 12 investigates the need for revolution, and a case is made for the sad necessity of a violent revolution, since the existing order is maintained by violence, and the privileged class will not surrender their hold on power unless it is shaken loose. My mom asked me like a week or two ago, she's like, my mom's getting better. <laughs> she asked me, she was like, what about the rich people who don't want to give up their shit? And I was like, Hello, Mr. Bezos. Give me your money. Or I'm going to make you play Minecraft forever. And you don't want to play Minecraft forever, man. That shit's going to get boring by hour 48. In Dialogue 13, we meet a new par character, Vincenzo, a young Republican and a discussion ensues regarding the merits and limitations of a Republican approach to change. I think by Republican, they're kind of meaning like, of a Republic, like, like early America. Its chief defect is identified as a reliance on government and on systems of democratic representation. Yeah, yeah like America. Republicanism is not, it is argued, as radical as its supporters believe, since it remains prey <coughs> to the evils of the existing political system. The last dialogue of this new series, Dialogue 14, returns to the theme of revolution. What Giorgio emphasizes is that anarchism, in its desire to remove the state and government, is a new factor in history and proposes changes quite different and more profound than previous revolutions, which aims simply at changing the political regime. 
it's very important is that in the like like the vast vast all i want to say all but i don't know if that's absolutely true i'm not like a historian the vast majority of revolutions for the last 300 years have not been like let's make a utopia so much as i don't like those guys in government i want these guys in government <laughs> once more the dialogues were to be interrupted by political events in June 1914, as the storm clouds of World War I gathered, serious popular risings broke out in the marches in Romagna in what became known as Red Week. Malatesta was involved in these popular struggles and, as a result, was forced to take refuge in London. Six years passed and Malatesta returned to Italy, establishing himself in Milan, where he edited the newspaper Umanita Nova. He was too busy, Fabry notes, to give his attention to the old dialogues and he did not intend to add to them. However, Fabry informs us that someone or other who spent a fortnight with him as a guest persuaded him to continue with the project. The mysterious guest must, one would think, have been Fabry himself. The result... <coughs> I'm, my throat is still not 100%. Mm. Fabry notes to give his attention to the old dialogues, and he did not intend to... The mysterious guest must, one would think, have been Fabry himself. The result was a further three dialogues, a continuation rather than a conclusion, since there is no obvious point of closure. You can argue forever, man. In these last three essays, some old topics are revisited and some new themes of contemporary significance receive attention. Dialogue 15 induces Gino, a worker, and canvasses the fears of ordinary people about a lack of civil order and the proposed stateless society and the perceived need for police. Police, Malatesta argues through Giorgio, breed criminals, just as he had argued earlier in Anarchy, that the Louvre Louvre wolf catchers, breed wolves, since without wolves or criminals, the survival of the respective bodies of officials would be in jeopardy. Social defense, he asserts, is a, com is a community responsibility. <clears throat> the fact that this issue was already discussed in Dialogue 11 is an indictment of its importance to Malatesta. In Dialogue 16, we meet Pippo, a crippled war veteran who opens up the questions of nationalism and patriotism. The points Malatesta makes here echo Lenin's call for class solidarity in the face of the devices and destructive nationalism of the First World War. <clears throat> Giorgio makes it clear that in his view, patriotism is simply a device by which the bourgeoisie recruits working class support for the existing property regime and the territorial ambitions of those who benefit from it. Finally, that's that's like so, that's what I think is, is maybe the, the sad thing about all the MAGA people. They're swindled. They're getting, they're getting swindled by people of power so they can die to protect private property. That's just sad. It sucks to see people like taken in by con men and like literally made into their gun. Finally, in Dialogue 17, Luigi, a socialist, enters, I always knew Luigi was a socialist, <laughs> enters, and, enters and a discussion ensues that aims at distinguishing anarchism from both parliamentary and authoritarian socialism but with the key focus on the inevitable failure of the parliamentary path and of any form of what Edward Bernstein had called evolutionary socialism, the need for a revolutionary change is underlined. Work on the dialogues in their present form was completed by October 1920. On 16th of October, Malatesta was arrested and placed in the prison of San Vittori. There was an extensive police search of an apartment for arms and explosives but the manuscript of the dialogues remained undiscovered or ignored. They were published as a set with Fabry's introduction in 1922. It's a real friend. These dialogues of Malatesta represent not just a major contribution to anarchist political theory, but a significant historical document written over a period of 23 years. They are a commentary on turbulent times and vital historical events, covering as they do an epoch distinguished in particular by left-wing agitation and organization across Europe. During the time spanned by these ruminations on anarchism, the world witnessed the Second International, 
the rise of Bolshevism, the First World War, the birth of fascism, and the Russian revolutions, both of 1904 and 1917. Without any direct allusion to any of these events, the dialogues engage in a lively debate with many of the issues that they raise. In a real sense, Malatesta has crafted anarchist theory into a running commentary on his times. It's a work of intelligence, style, and real artistry. My throat feels like more strained than I thought it would. But it's like three pages for the first part, so we're going to read that. So it's like, list the person's name and then their dialogue. I'm going to read the person's name. <clears throat> Prospero, a plump member of the bourgeoisie, full of political economy and other sciences. But of course, of course, we all know about it. There are people suffering from hunger, women prostituting themselves, children dying from a lack of care. You always say the same thing. In the end, you become boring. Allow me to savor my gelati in peace, certainly. There are a thousand evils in our society. Hunger, ignorance, war, crime, plague, terrible mishaps. So what? Why is it your concern? Michelle, a student who keeps company with socialists and anarchists. I beg your pardon? Why is it my concern? You have a comfortable home, a well-provisioned table, servants at your command. For everything that is fine and as long as you and yours are all right. Even if the world around you collapses, nothing matters. Really, if you only had a little heart. Prospero, enough, enough. Don't s sermonize. Stop raging, young man. You think I'm an insensible indifferent to the misfortunes of others. On the contrary, my heart bleeds. Waiter, bring me a cognac and a cigar. My heart bleeds. But the great social problems are not resolved by sentiment. The laws of nature are immutable, and neither great speeches nor mawkish sentimentality can do anything about it. The wise person accepts fate and gets the best out of life that he can without running after pointless dreams. This is just going to be a weird-ass accent I'm pulling out for that. Dialect. Michelle, ah, so we are dealing with natural laws. And what if the poor got it into their heads to correct these laws of nature? <clears throat> I have heard speeches hardly supportive of these superior laws. <coughs> mm, Prospero, of course, of course. We all know the people with whom you associate. On my behalf, tell these scoundrels, socialists, and anarchists who you have chosen to be a preferred company that for them, and for those who would try to put into practice their wicked theories, we have good soldiers and excellent carinaberry. Like car carabine, like a, like a carbine. Gun. Michelle, oh, if you're going to bring in the soldiers and the carabinieri, I won't talk anymore. It's like proposing a fist fight to demonstrate my opinions are in error. However, don't rely on brute force if you have no other arguments. Tomorrow you may find yourself in the weakest position. What then? Prospero, what then? What if the misfortune should come about? There would be great disorder, an explosion of evil passions, massacres, looting, and then it would all return to how it was before. Maybe a few poor people would have been would become enriched. Some rich people would have fallen into poverty. But overall, nothing would have changed because this because the world cannot change. Bring me, bring me one of these anarchist agitators of yours, and you will see how I will turn his hide. They're good at filling the heads of people like you with tall stories because your heads are empty. But you'll see whether they will be able to maintain their absurdities with me, Michelle. All right, I'll bring a friend of mine who holds socialist and anarchist principles, and I will promote your discussion with him with pleasure. <coughs> In the meantime, discuss matters with me, for while I still don't have well-developed opinions, I clearly see that society as it is organized today is a thing contrary to good sense and decency. Come now, you are so fat and flourishing that a bit of excitement will not do you any harm. It will help your digestion. Prospero. Come on, then, let's have a discussion. But you ought to know that it would be better if you studied instead of spitting out opinions about matters that are the province of others more learned and wiser. I believe I can give you 20 years. Michelle, this does not prove that you have studied more. And if I, and if I have to judge you from what you've been saying, I doubt that. Even if you have studied a lot, you have gained much from it. Prospero, young man, young man, really, let's have some respect. Michelle, all right, I respect you, but I don't throw my age in my face, as if in fact you were raising objection to me with the police. 
Arguments are not old or young. They are good or bad. That's all. Prospero. Well, well, let's get on with what you have to say. Michelle. I must say that I cannot understand why the peasants that hoe, sow, and harvest have neither sufficient bread nor wine or meat. Why bricklayers that build houses don't have a roof for shelter. Why shoemakers have worn shoes. In other words, why is it that those who work, that produce everything, lack basic necessities, while those who don't do anything revel in abundance? I cannot understand why there are people that lack bread when there is so much uncultivated land and a lot of people would be extremely happy to be able to cultivate it. Why are there so many bricklayers out of work? And while there are lots of people who need houses, why many shoemakers, dressmakers, etc. are without work? Well, the majority of the population lacks shoes, clothes, and all necessities of civil life. Could you please tell me which is the natural law that explains and justifies these absurdities? <clears throat> Prospero. Nothing. <clears throat> I don't even know what... I'm trying to affect like a posh accent. Like what I imagine like Victorian nobility was like. Based on Downton Abbey or some bullshit. I don't fucking know. <clears throat> Nothing could be more clear and simple. To produce human labor is not enough. You need land, materials, tools, premises, machinery, and you also need the means to survive while waiting for the product to be made and delivered to the market. In a word, you need capital. Your peasants, your workers, have only their physical labor. As a consequence, they cannot work if such is not the wish of those who own land and capital. And since we are few in number and have enough even if for a while, we leave our land uncultivated and our capital inoperative, while well, the workers are many and are always constrained by immediate needs. It follows that they must work whenever and however we wish, and on whatever terms that suit us. And when we no longer need their labor and calculate that there is no gain from making them work, they are forced to remain idle, even when they have the greatest need for the very things they could produce. Are you content now? Could I explain it more clearly than this? Michelle, certainly this is what one calls speaking frankly. There's no question about that. But by what right does the land belong only to a few? How is it that capital is found in a few hands, specifically in the hands of those who do not work? <clears throat> Prospero. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yes, yes, I know what you are saying to me. And I even know that more or less the lame arguments with which others would oppose you, the right of the owners derives from the improvement they bring to the land from savings by means of which labor is transformed into capital, etc., but let me be even more frank. Things are as they are, as the result of historical facts, the product of hundreds of years of human history, the whole of human existence has been, is, and will always be a continuous struggle. There are those who have fared well and those who have fared badly. What can I do about it? So much the worse for some, so much the better for others. Woe to the conquered. This is the grand law of nature against which no revolt is possible. What would you like? Should I deprive myself of all I have so I can rot in poverty while someone else stuffs themselves on my money? Michelle, I do not exactly want that, but I'm thinking that the workers profiting from their numbers and basing themselves on your theory that life is in fact a struggle and that, the, and that rights derive from facts get the idea into their head of creating a new historical fact by taking away your land and capital, capital and inaugurating new rights. Prospero, ah, uh, certainly, that would complicate matters, but we shall continue on another occasion. Now I have to go to the theatre. Good evening to you all. I cannot tell if I want to keep doing that specific accent. I'm going to have to, like, listen back. All right. It's a lot for me to speak at like a continued way like that. Have a good rest of your day, night, evening, whatever the fuck. I'm going to try to fix my car and then I'll keep reading this tomorrow. Have a good one.